Hello there and welcome to Learn A-Level Biology for Free with Miss Estrick. I'm going to be going through the structure of skeletal muscle today and its function in the sliding filament theory. So make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss out on any of the latest videos. So muscles, and we're thinking about skeletal muscles here, occur in antagonistic pairs. And what that means is for each part of the skeleton, there are two muscles attached and they'll always work in opposite. So as one contracts, the other relaxes. And this will then cause the movement of that part of the skeleton. And this can be an automatic part um, of a reflex response, meaning you don't think about it, or it can be controlled by con conscious thought. So thought there. So what we're going to be having a look at is the structure of this skeletal muscle. And the structure in particular that we focus on is what we call a myofibril. And that then branches into um, the sarcomere and we'll be looking at the sarcoplasm as well. So the myofibril here is made up of fused cells and they share nuclei and cytoplasm. But we call the cytoplasm sarcoplasm. And there's also a very, very high number of mitochondria because ATP is essential for muscle contraction. So you can actually see more structures here than you need to, in particular down this part at the bottom. But what this is showing you is um, lots of these cells fuse together. We can see they're sharing the nucleus. And in the paler blue is the mitochondria. So there are quite a lot of mitochondria. And the myofibrils is what we're going to be focusing on. It's all of these thread-like structures bundled together. And we have one part focusing here, um, coming out, and that is made up of lots of what we call sarcomeres. And that's what we're going to look at in a bit more detail. So muscle fibres, as we said, are made up of lots and lots of myofibrils, in fact, millions of myofibrils, which are all fusing together, uh, fused together cells, and they are what collectively bring about the movement of your skeleton. And one of these myofibrils are made up of two key proteins. So you're probably familiar with the concept that muscles are made up of proteins. And there's two that you need to know about in detail. And that is myosin and actin. And they collectively create what we call the sarcomere. And we haven't actually got them labelled on these diagrams, um, but they are thin and thick filaments. So it is labelled a bit clearer on this one here. In your sarcomere, the myosin protein is much, much thicker. And that's visibly shown by these thicker lines. Whereas the actin protein or actin filament is a much thinner protein. And we can see that here. And they're actually layered in this position. So we have a layer of actin, then you have your myosin in the middle, actin, myosin, actin, myosin, and so on. So just down here at the bottom, it's showing you if you were to slice through your sarcomere to look at a cross section, at this particular position, we would have a mixture of, you'd be able to see the actin and the myosin. In the middle, which we're going to be looking at what these zones actually mean, it's called an H zone, there you would just see the presence of the myosin if you took a cross section and at the very very end which is called the i band again we'll come back to these terms um, that would just be the thin filament the actin that you can see and this does slightly change when the muscle contracts compared to when it is relaxed so we're going to be looking at how these proteins are able to slide when the muscles contract um, and then they'll move back again when the muscle relaxes. And this takes us on to what is called the sliding filament theory. So when an action potential reaches a muscle, it stimulates a response. And I've linked up here my video on synapses, because within that you'll be able to see the neuromuscular junction. And that links to this first point here, when the action potential which has been traveling along the motor neuron, reaches a muscle, how it can then stimulate the response. So what happens is within the muscle, calcium ions 
are released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which is like a membrane within these cells. And those calcium ions enter and they're able to bind to a protein which is wrapped around your actin protein. And we can see that here in pale blue. So these long thin strands of tropomyosin wrap around the actin. And when a muscle is relaxed, the tropomyosin is covering binding sites. And these are the binding sites which the myosin can attach to. So if there is not an action potential, there won't be the release of calcium ions binding to the tropomyosin, and therefore you won't have the actin having the binding sites exposed. So you cannot have muscle contraction without these calcium ions. Now, just to make you aware, in this diagram, there is a second protein attached to the tropomyosin called troponin. That was on the old specification. You now do not need to know about troponin for the 2015 spec for AQA. But what does happen is the calcium actually binds to the troponin and the troponin moves the tropomyosin out of the way. For AQA, it's sufficient just to say calcium ions enter and it causes the tropomyosin to move and therefore it exposes the binding sites. So what then happens is we've got these exposed binding sites because of those calcium ions moving the tropomyosin and we can have the myosin heads are able then to attach to these exposed binding sites. And that is happening whilst we have ADP attached to the myosin head. And when we then have the myosin head part of the myosin attached to the actin, we call this a cross bridge because it's now created this bridge between the actin and the myosin. And the angle created, this is when it's first bound, but what actually then happens is that myosin head um, will actually get pulled into a particular angle, which creates tension. And as a result of that tension, the impact is it slides, it pulls and it slides the axin filament along the myosin. And in doing so, in that movement, ADP and PI are released. So that is our first step in contraction. The myosin's bound, we then get this um, cross bridge, which the head is then put at a particular angle, creating tension. And to relieve that tension, it slides along the actin. But that movement causes ADP and PI to be released. So the next step then is a new ATP molecule can then bind to the myosin head. And this actually causes, the energy will then cause the head to change shape slightly. And that slight change in shape means it's no longer complementary to the actin binding sites. And as a result, it detaches. So we then have, within the sarcoplasm, there are enzymes. One of those enzymes is ATPase, and that is activated by the calcium ions also to hydrolyze the ATP that's attached to the myosin head. And it releases enough energy from that myosin head so that it's then got the ADP attached and the myosin head can return to its original position. So this entire process will then repeat. So we're now back to the beginning where the myosin head can then rebind to the axin. That creates tension, slides it along and so on. So this process continually happens until the axin cannot be moved any closer together or until you run out of ATP. And therefore, the muscle will remain stimulated by the nervous system for as long as the calcium ions are being released and we have ATP present. So that's how you end up with this full muscle contraction in this sliding filament theory. So this is also pointing out why ATP is such an important molecule for muscle contractions. And you have to have very high concentrations of ATP for the muscle to fully contract.
And that is why there are so many mitochondria in the myofibril. And it's worth just noting in times when aerobic respiration cannot create enough ATP to meet the demand, that is when anaerobic respiration will also occur. So if you think about sprinting, sprinting, so sprinting runners, for example, they need a really, really high amount of ATP rapidly. Don't need it for a long period of time, though. So their muscles will actually respire anaerobically to create this high concentration of ATP rapidly so the muscles can contract and relax. Now, this is assisted by the chemical phosphocreatine. And this naturally occurs in your muscles, it's stored in your muscles. And what this does is it provides phosphates to help regenerate ATP from ADP. So the last thing is going back to these bands that we referred to when we looked at the sarcomere. And there's particular bands on the sarcomere that you need to be familiar with. And we can see them over here on these micrograph images. So we have what's called the I band, which we can see here, also labeled on the diagram. We have the A band, the Z line, and this M line and H zone. So there are quite a few different bands and zones that you do need to know. You could be asked to label them, or you could be asked what happens to the width or position of them when a muscle contracts and that's what we're going to look at so this top image is showing you the sarcomere when the muscle is relaxed so in this case the myosin is shown in blue and the actin is shown in red the a band is the total width of the myosin the h zone is just the parts where it's myosin only so although there is part of the A band which overlaps with the actin, the H zone is just labelling where the myosin is by itself. The I band is labelling where the actin is by itself, so where there is no overlap with any myosin. The M line, that is just the middle point of the um, myosin. And the Z lines indicate the parameters of one sarcomere. So we've got the start and the end. And we can see on the micrograph, it actually demonstrates these thick versus thin proteins or filaments. Because the I bands, where it is just the actin, is much, much paler. And where we have the myosin, it's much darker. And that's because myosin is a thicker protein. So when your muscle is relaxed, we can see the position. When the muscles contract, we looked at that sliding filament theory. The myosin attaches to the actin and it slides those actin filaments closer to the middle, closer together. So what happens is the actin on both sides of the sarcomere end up closer together. So that will mean that we can see the I band has become much smaller because so instead of having this big width here where the I band the actin is just by itself because it's now been slid over the myosin your I band decreases when the muscle contracts the H zone also decreases and this we said was the zone where it was just myosin by itself but because the actin is now slid closer together your H zone has decreased now, those are actually the only two bands that will decrease. The I, the I band and the H zone both decrease in width. The A band will never change because myosin isn't moving. The heads are attaching and pulling, but the myosin itself doesn't get shorter or fatter. It stays constant. So the A band will always stay constant. The two Z lines will move closer together. And we can't actually see that particularly well in the micrograph image, but it's demonstrated much clearer here. We've got the end of the Z zone here, but because they're sliding closer together, we can see the sarcomere shortens and it's contracted. So we can see that the Z lines are closer together.
The very last bit of information you could be asked about is two different types of muscles. And this is still to do with skeletal muscle, and that is slow versus fast twitch. So I've summarized it here in the table to show the differences between the two. And the name pretty much tells you a bit about some of the properties. So let's have a look at the slow twitch muscle fibers first of all. Now these contain large stores of myoglobin, and that is a protein similar to hemoglobin, but it can store lots of oxygen. Um, and you also have a rich blood supply, and you have an even higher proportion of mitochondria. So these are the three key structures. An example is your calf muscles. Now these structural features link to the properties down here. So these muscles contract slower, which is why they're called slow twitch fibers. So they're not going to be good for sprinting, but what they are good for is duration exercise. And that's because they can respire aerobically for long periods of time before they will fatigue. And the reason for that is these properties up above. Number one, we've got this store of myoglobin, which means we've got this good oxygen store. There's a very good rich blood supply, again, constantly providing oxygen and glucose for aerobic respiration. And lots of mitochondria, again, for aerobic respiration. So if you are um, an endurance worker or a marathon runner, your body will actually start to develop a higher proportion of slow twitch fibers as you train. And that is why over time with training, or one of the reasons why, over time with training, your body adapts to be able to do that exercise. You'll get a higher proportion of slow twitch fibers, particularly in your leg muscles like your calves, so you can exercise for longer before the muscles are going to fatigue. Now in contrast, the fast twitch fibers, the structure, first of all, much thicker muscles, um, and there's more myosin filaments. You have a large store of glycogen, a store of phosphocreatine, which we looked at earlier, and also um, a high concentration of enzymes involved in anaerobic respiration. And a good example of this is your biceps. So you can't, or most people can't do that many push-ups, um, and we'll come to the reason for that. Now, fast twitch, like the name suggests, these contract much, much faster, and they can provide short bursts of much more powerful contractions. So this is for your exercises like boxing and sprinting. So you've got your intense exercise, um, and that links to the fact that you're going to be respiring, these muscles respire more so anaerobically. So you get this short but high burst of ATP, and therefore you can get a more powerful contraction, but the muscles will fatigue very quickly because it's anaerobic respiration, and therefore lactic acid builds up. And all of these properties are to enable anaerobic respiration. So that is it, that's what you need to know for your muscles. I hope you found it helpful. If you did, please give it a thumbs up.